Murder and Such contains true stories about murders, the macabre, true crime, serial killers, and other dark subject matter. This includes adult themes, explicit language, descriptions of gore, violence, and other information provided by news articles, witness testimony, and public record. Murder and Such is not intended for all audiences, and although warnings will be set in place, listener discretion is still advised. Well, well, well. Welcome back. This is part two of my Ed Edwards series. Now, let's go back in time a little bit. By this time, Ed had gotten himself another wife in July of 1968 when he married a woman by the name of Kay Hederly and managed to have a couple of kids with her. Now, I can't say for sure if he had any other children with the women that he had been with over his years of managing department stores, but he did manage to have a son with his now ex-wife, Jeanette White, by the name of Wayne Edwards. It was suspected by his own admission that he had four children, but only three of which have been accounted for. Now, an article that was posted on August 9th of 1977, the front page of the Daily Recorder out of Wooster, Ohio, it read, Police as of yet have no suspects in the possible homicides of two Wayne County residents whose bodies were found Monday morning in Silver Creek Metropolitan Park on Medina County Line Road on the border of Way and Summit Counties by Norton Police. The bodies of William J. Lavaco, 21, of Doylestown, and Judith Straub of Sterling were discovered during a helicopter search of the area. Both were victims of apparent gunshot wounds in the neck and had been missing since early Saturday morning. Norton Police have been joined in their investigation by Doylestown Police and Wayne County Sheriff James Frost. Norton Police Chief Forrest Dyfendorf said his department became involved when a 1975 Monte Carlo was discovered apparently abandoned at the park on Sunday. They watched the car until 9 p.m. to see if it was claimed, and when it was not, they made a registration check and search of the car determined that it was stolen. Lavaco's mother, Mrs. Vivian Dance of Orville, was then contacted to see if she knew of her son's whereabouts. Neither she nor his roommate, Jeff Morgenstern, had seen them since early Friday evening. At that time, Dyfendorf said Mrs. Dance was advised to file a missing persons report. Miss Straub's parents were contacted shortly after Mrs. Dance in an effort to determine the girl's whereabouts. They filed a missing persons report with the Wayne County Sheriff's Department at 12.11 a.m. Sunday. It was after dark when the police began a search of the area, but found no signs of the couple. Quote, It is a very difficult area to see, even in the daylights, Dyfendorf said. At daylight, a helicopter was sent over the area and sighted the bodies approximately 300 feet from the abandoned car in a densely wooded area of the park. After the bodies were discovered, an intensive search was made of the area by police with metal detectors to find the weapon. Ten area scuba divers scoured the bottom of a pond at the park for over an hour, but found nothing. Quote, since no gun was found at the scene, Dyfendorf said, we are working on the assumption that this point was a double homicide. Indeed, it was a double homicide, and there was no motive. It would seem for Edward, at least by 1977, he had the money that he needed. There were over $400 worth of valuables inside of the car, so that would have ruled out the possibility of a robbery gone wrong. 
As far as suspects were concerned, they only found one two years later when a man by the name of Jay Starcher had come to the authorities with a revelation that he had witnessed a man by the name of Dennis Busan arguing with Billy Lavaco about what he thought was cocaine. They later questioned Dennis, but they found that there was nothing to go off of. This one break, two years later, turned out to be nothing. The parents of each victim had no answers, and the police never found their man. Well, not exactly. Let's go back to uh, this 1977. And you killed Judith Straub and Bill Levecko at uh, close range. And that was, they were in Akron. They were in Akron area couple. In Norton. Why? As you guys like so much, this is Ed Edwards. And this is from a 2010 interview that Ed had given while he was incarcerated. This is his own account of what happened to these two young victims. You didn't even know them, did you? Oh, yes, I knew them very well. Uh, uh, knew them very well and uh, had uh, told him on uh, different occasions that uh, if he did not stop making eyes and fooling around with my small children and being around them, that he was going to end up getting hurt. And after about the fourth or fifth time I explained that to him, I told him, I said, I'm gonna tell you something, Bill, I'm gonna kill you if you do it one more time. And it just so happened that Judith, uh, Judith was a prostitute. She used, when we used to go up town in, in, in uh, 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 now I can't think of the, Right up in Wayne County. You were downtown there, 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 there. No, we were living in uh, in Wayne County, uh, right out Route 21. I can't think of the name of the little town up there. But we used to go up there and shoot pool and uh, everything. And she'd be out in the car making money with prostitution and stuff like that. Well, I did not expect her to be with him this particular night. She was, it was dark, she did not recognize me, I know she didn't, and I told her to stay in the car, I wanted to talk to him. And I said, please, it was about, one, about three o'clock in the morning. And Doylestown was where I was, we were living, uh, this happened. and. Uh, so I was over there with Bill, talking to him, telling him that, and then she insisted to be there. She got out of the car, come on over. And then at that time, Bill told her, says, look, Wayne, there's $500 in her purse in the car. If you want money, why don't you just get it? I says, Bill, do you know what you just did? And at that, that moment, I shot him, we killed him. What he just did was tell her who I was. And she started to run. I told her to stop. I wasn't gonna shoot her or kill her. I only had a single gauge, single gauge shotgun. She come back by the time I had one another one I put in and I shot her, but I didn't threaten her. Uh, I tell her I was gonna I didn't even give reasons for him. There was no threats. There was no pleading and things like this here. I will get into why he was put in prison a little later in this episode, but there were so many people that he had been suspected of killing as I mentioned in part one of this series. One that I had not mentioned was the murder of a woman by the name of Verna back in 1955 who was allegedly pregnant with his child. She was 17 years old. Another was the murder of a woman named Stephanie Bryan in San Francisco on April 28th of 1955. After her body was found two weeks later, they had convicted a man by the name of Burton Abbott and executed him in March of 1957. 
But the other murders that he was theorized to have committed was the murders of three young boys, Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers, also known as the West Memphis Three Murders. The murder of John Bonet Ramsey, and even suspected him to have murdered Teresa Halbach, the focal point of the Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer, in which Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are currently behind bars for. I obviously have my suspicions, and granted, most of us who listen to true crime want a story that has a conclusive outcome. Hell, I have yet to do an actual cold case due to the fact that I will start questioning myself when it comes to my research and scripting. I don't want to paint a target onto someone's back that may or may not be warranted. But with true crime, people do want an outcome, a judgment, and of course, justice. I think a lot of these suspected crimes that people believe Edward may have killed are sometimes people who want to see a conclusion to the unknown. Some solace for the family, and some questions finally answered. But as we have 328 million people in America and have seen people come in and out of this country over the course of the past 60 years, the chances of this one man going clear across the country committing the Ted Cruz Zodiac killings and then back across the country to do the Atlanta child murders, then kill Elizabeth Short, kill John Bonet, killed Jimmy Hoffa, killed Teresa Halbach, he would either have to have like the best frequent flyer miles card on the planet or be a member of the Clinton Foundation. See, look at that. I can make jabs at people on the left too. But I don't think he's the one who committed some of the most high profile, prolific cases in American history. It just doesn't seem too feasible for me. However, there's another that I do believe there's a motive, reason, and some very telling evidence, like it may be more than just a simple coincidence. Sister Margaret Ann Paul was a nun and caretaker of the chapel on the grounds of the Mercy Hospital in Toledo, Ohio. The night of Saturday, April 5th, 1980, an attacker had come in and stabbed Sister Margaret to death 31 times, including nine times in the shape of an inverted cross on her chest and 22 times on the face, only on the left side. If you know much about Satanism, you'd know that the left-hand path is the one that's most associated with the taboo side, in which includes the questioning of religious and moral dogma, the embracing of sexuality, obviously something that stands in stark contrast to the teachings of the Catholic Church. The investigators had came to the conclusion that the reason of the inverted cross wounds was to humiliate her remains. You need to remember, that back when Ed was a child, he had been humiliated and beaten not only by the boys at the orphanage, but also by Sister Agnes Marie for his bedwetting. With him being a young child, you can just about imagine the resentment he harbored for the Catholic Church and the church staff alike. Another thing I found, and yes, this may be coincidental, was the date. Back in 1951, I noted that Romeo Baudry was shot four times in the gas station in Florida, and the killer was never found. That day was Easter Sunday. Sister Margaret Ann Paul was also murdered, then found, on Easter Sunday. Granted, it was March 25th when it was Easter in 1951, But for a murderous sycophant like Ed Edwards, the humiliation, murder, and the date kind of match up pretty well as some sort of, uh, think of it kind of like a disgusting anniversary. For Sister Margaret, they had arrested someone by the name of Father Gerald Robinson, who worked at the Mercy Hospital with her. 
They worked closely together, and he even presided over her funeral mass four days after her death had happened. They had questioned him numerous times, and they thought that they had found a murder weapon in his possession, a sword-shaped letter opener that was found in his apartment. However, although they said that it was indeed the murder weapon, they later went on to testify that they thought that it could not be ruled out as far as the evidence was concerned. Three people had testified it was in fact him who did it as they saw him at the church at the time of the murder. But later when he was arrested, he went on to trial on April 24th of 2006 for the murder and had convicted him on all counts on May 11th of 2006. He had appealed and it was reaffirmed in July of 2008. He tried to have the Ohio Supreme Court hear his case in 2012 to have his charges quashed, but later in February of 2013, they denied his appeal. Father Robinson died of a heart attack on the 4th of July of 2014, but there's a few small things about this. A lot of the evidence that they had gathered was not public knowledge. The murder? Yes. Robinson being a suspect? Yes. But there was always questions as to whether or not he actually did it. One piece of evidence that points to him being innocent was an anonymous letter that was sent shortly after Sister Margaret was killed on the church grounds. And that read, quote, He has a perverse hate for the Catholic Church, and especially nuns, a bitter and imbalanced ex-Catholic himself. He's very sick and needs help, a psychopath with great potential for violence. He's a woman hater, sexually deviant. He's into devil worship. Many times he has jokingly threatened exactly this kind of crime. I hope you can help him and stop this before it happens again. It's in your hands. Signed, Christ help us. Now, Ed Edwards was in Ohio at the time of her murder. And there was a lot of information that the police had pointing to a cover-up that was happening, including some less-than-gracious work done by the police department presiding over the case. I personally firmly believe that Father Robinson was wrongfully convicted and the Ohio justice system just wanted the man that they had behind bars because, you know... Overturning a conviction isn't something that anybody wants to have done to them, especially the prosecution. But as for being 100% certain without a shadow of a doubt, I'll let you decide that. Now, for the next part, let's just say that Ed takes a little bit of a break. Because the next murder, or I should say double murder, happens on August 9th, of 1980. The town of Jefferson, Wisconsin, roughly 40 miles west of Milwaukee, Kelly Drew and Tim Hack were lovers, but their love was cut short on one night as they were reported missing the following day. They were at a venue called the Concord House, attending a wedding reception on that night, amongst around a hundred other people but they still went missing without a trace. Their bodies would not be discovered until nearly two months later along a railroad track parallel with Highway 16 by a couple of hunters. Ed Edwards was staying there at the time and he had decided to try and persuade Kelly Drew. When the authorities came to the crime scene, there wasn't a whole lot that they initially had discovered as the remains of Kelly and Tim were mostly decomposed or had been picked off by animals in the area prior to their discovery. But as time grew from his first murder up until the 1980s, they were able to get a DNA sample that showed that Kelly had semen inside of her at the time of her murder. As for a DNA match, they did not have one when they found the remains. But again, straight from the horse's mouth while he's in prison, 
Here is what Ed had to say. Okay, what happened with uh, Kelly Drew and Tim Hack in Jefferson, Wisconsin? Was that was rape, right? That was what? Rape. Hell no, it wasn't rape. I've never raped anybody. Well, that's it. They found semen. No. Uh, first of all, the girl and I, Kelly, we knew each other. Okay, I had I was doing work up there at the they uh, were the dance hall and the bar and and everything at or at and uh, doing carpentry work and rebuilding. My son was helping me, but we lived uh, about three or four miles away in a farmhouse that we had rent had rented. And uh, Kelly and I had been together. It was a wedding reception. And the boy, the man, he was inside, he was arguing over a tractor, he was into tractors, tractor poles and expensive tractors. He was in there arguing and she didn't want to hear it. She came on out and I was out in the bars right next door. We went on over to the car and uh, we had our fun. Uh, Sexually? Yes. And uh, so we, she went on back. And as she went around the corner to go into the uh, reception hall where the, he was coming out and they started arguing. And this arguing it progressed, oh, a couple hundred feet down toward the end, the end of the building. And now there's no lights down there or anything. And he had pushed her. And so I had walked over. And at that time, uh, it was kind of obvious to him that I was the reason why she, where, where she, he didn't know where she was. And uh, he pushed her again, she went down, and I hit him in the neck. Real, very hard. I, I was a husky man then, and we're talking about 1980. And uh, in the neck here, the rabbit punch. Uh, but anyways, he went down, and he stayed down. And I'm bent over to see here. I mean, because I, I didn't mean, I didn't, I, my intent was not to kill him. It was just get him off of her and get him away from me. Well, as it worked out, then she started piling on me, and she talked about he's dead, he's dead, and she started smacking me and everything, so I ended up choking her uh, right there, and that's where they both died, but I didn't leave them there. I let, uh, they, they were, I pulled them back away from the any body, because there was nothing there. It was all cows and everything out in there, and woods. And I went down, not the front way, but around the back way, got my van, brought it back around the back way, got them in the, put them in the uh, van and, and drove off and exposed them in a uh, cornfield. No, she was not raped and that's how that came about. But you had sex with her? Yeah, I had sex with her on oh, five or six occasions. Okay. Wasn't there a better way to deal with that situation? Explain to police that that he had attacked you and you had acted in self-defense. No, uh, it, when uh, I first of all was having sex with her, uh, I had a family, had five children, and uh, you were cheating on your wife and your family. Yes, yes, and uh, I had a record from way back. Nothing there, but then uh, uh, I also had that double murder there in Norton they didn't know about. But no, that that was for my lifestyle and everything. No, I just killed two people. No way in hell was I about to call the police up because I wasn't from there and uh, uh, I'd have been convicted. Now, I'm going to take a small break, pay some bills, and we'll be right back. And we're back. So now you've heard this asshole talking a few times. Judging by his own sound, he doesn't appear to be this criminal mastermind. 
although he is most definitely a serial killer by all definitions. But you have to go back to when he first started killing people. Forensic evidence, surveillance, crime scene delicacy, and all of that wasn't taken as seriously as it is today. The vast majority of it would be predicated on witness testimony, which can be credible evidence at times. Some of the people who were convicted absolutely were rightfully convicted without a shadow of a doubt, but I believe that others have been wrongfully convicted based on the credibility of the evidence that they had to go off of. Could it be the sloppiness of the investigators? Possibly. Could it be the reliability of witness testimony? Also, possibly. But the final ones that I'm focusing on right here are the ones that we know almost for sure that Ed had something to do with. And you can hear that in his own voice. Now, as far as Edward's relationship with Kay, they had a lengthy marriage, and it seemed like Ed was kind of your run-of-the-mill, good old-fashioned father. He cared about his children with all of his heart, but as his daughter April had said, he had one hell of a mean streak, and nobody would want to be on the receiving end of it. Kay obviously knew about his fuckery that he was up to, but she also never really knew about the murders that he had committed. She stated that he had books and devices for making false credentials, and was completely obsessed with FBI investigations. There were also files that he had in a dresser in his room that absolutely nobody was allowed to touch. He also saved articles from the murders of Larry Payton and Beverly Allen. Now a lot of killers have a keepsake that they keep from a murder, whether it's a token or some sort of a belonging from the victims, but sometimes it can be an article about the crime that happened. With that, he had another article that occurred in Portland. Now I do think that he had something to do with this, although I've said before, it could be completely coincidental. On January 23rd of 1961, the title of a news article reads, Navy man said dead. Body blasted by TNT charge near Napa. The piece goes on to say, The blasted body of a man tentatively identified as that of sailor Wayne A. Budd, 25, of the Tongue Point Naval Station was discovered Monday night in the Napa Swenson area near Astoria. The body was reported blown to bits by a charge reported as TNT. A naval identification card was found nearby made out to an engine man, Wayne A. Budd, formerly of Olympia. Missing since November 28, 1960, and for a time sought in connection with the baffling Peyton Allen murders case of November 27th. Bud was never listed as a suspect in the murder, but the disappearance of the sailor coincident with the crime caused detectives to seek him for questioning. Search into the area and investigation of the remains is in charge of the Clatstop County Sheriff, Carl B. Bondietti, with men from State Police and Astoria Police Department, assisting in Portland. Captain Gordon Auburn, head of the Peyton Allen investigation, immediately left his office, but no other detectives have been detailed to the Astoria investigation. Bud's disappearance had a number of puzzling aspects. He left his station November 27th with a pass good until Monday morning, November 28th. He left a car on base and about $4,000 in naval payroll savings. His personal effects included $60 in his locker and a 38 caliber pistol. He was last seen hitchhiking in old clothes by a naval officer who let him off in the Swenson area. The officer said Bud told him he intended to go hunting, although he had no gear with him. He is reported to have hitched another ride to the dense Swenson woodland. Investigators from the county sheriff's office who checked Bud's disappearance intensively have now released a possible but bizarre motive for the murder of Bud if the blown-up body is that of Bud. 
Sheriff Bondietti said that the body was discovered by Carl Arino, a partner in a small lodging firm which had been working in the area. Bondietti said the time of death has been fixed to roughly some time during the day on November 27th, the second day of Bud's leave. The sheriff said interrogation of the residents of the death scene had disclosed there was an unexplained explosion on November 27th. As to the type of explosion used in the method of detonation, Bondietti said, quote, It's going to take a lot more work to pin down. We intend to resume our investigation tomorrow to see if we can come up with more answers. Now, as I mentioned about his book before, I believe that he gave Wayne Budd a different name in his book. In his own admission, he said that there was a person by the name of Johnny that he was talking about in said book. Personally, with a triple murder happening on the same day, not too far from the same area, and how the police were thinking it could have been connected in some way, I wouldn't put it past Ed to blow another man up, especially since this guy was also somewhat wanted in the questioning. Could that possibly get Ed in more trouble if they had questioned him about the double murder? Possibly. Also, thinking of Ed, I wouldn't put it past him to be carrying around a couple sticks of dynamite and blow a motherfucker up, either. So again, it is a coincidence, yes. But the time, the reasoning, and everything seems pretty suspect. Although, we will never know who truly killed Wayne Budd. Now, I'm going to fast forward quite a bit to 1996. And this is when tragedy actually struck Ed like it had done so many times before. He's currently living in northern Ohio with Kay and his kids. Working odd jobs, being your all-American dad, he becomes obsessive with the Oklahoma City bombing carried out by Timothy McVeigh. I mean, of course he is, because... He's a killer, and a lot of killers are looking at a body count as some sort of disgusting high scores, even though they're real people with real lives, families, friends, and they're all being taken away at the hands of a complete and utter sociopath with no regard for human life or even a real purpose in this world. The penultimate scum of the earth thinking that whoever has the high score at the end of their lifetime is going to win them some sort of sick fucking trophy or secure their spot in the history books. Complete and utter narcissism. No excuse, but I, and I may catch hell for this, would rather that Ed Edwards may have tried to suck start a pistol before carrying out all of these heinous murders. It's a controversial opinion, I know, but I have no regard for this man, much like he had no regard for all of the people that he had murdered. But while in Ohio, he and his wife seemed to have a pretty decent relationship. You know, aside from the shadiness, the lies, the murders, and everything else. He's seen as a pretty stand-up guy amongst his neighbors, and there's not a whole lot to go off of. He even mentored a kid by the name of Daniel Glockner, who had gone to school with his own children. Ed not only saw him as someone he could mentor, watch over, take under his wing, and try to form into a productive member of society that Ed could never be. Daniel, which I will be referring to as Danny, had somewhat of a mean streak which, as you can imagine, struck Ed pretty close to the chest since he was the same way while he was growing up. He had come from a broken home, his parents had divorced, and he was staying with a friend. But when he was 21, he was about to be thrown out onto the streets to fend for himself. So Kay and Ed had taken him in, given him food, shelter, and probably discipline. A chance to turn his life around, and a chance to find purpose. Hell, Ed had even convinced Danny to not only join the army, but he actually filed adoption papers to make Danny a member 
of his family. He had his name changed from Danny Law Glockner to Danny Boy Edwards, and at this time, Ed was aging. Ed was 63 years old back in 1996, so maybe, finally, the coin had fully flipped and he was going to try to live out the rest of his life as an old man with a very deep and dark secret. It kind of reminds you of Joseph James D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer. An old man with not much purpose in life, just going to live out the remaining years that he has left under the guise of being a harmless old man. But that is when tragedy had struck. Two days before Danny was going to be discharged from the army, he goes missing. It wouldn't be until a year later that his body is finally recovered after a hunter was walking through a field near the Troy Township Cemetery and stumbled upon the remains. The army had marked him as going AWOL, something that Ed was also quite familiar with, but his bones were recovered from a field. Danny Boy had a history of swindling and thieving from people around him, which also included Edward and his own families. But this was one of Ed's own kids. Well, by legal means. Could he really have been the one to have made Danny Boy disappear? Well, let's fast forward to July 30th of 2009. The town of Louisville, Kentucky, a place where Ed Edwards moved to a trailer park in 2000. A federal fugitive warrant is issued in the arrest of Edward Wayne Edwards. He is arrested and arraigned. But the reason? He is being wanted, even at 76 years old, for a murder that happened back in 1980. And more so, they were looking into other murders that he may have been associated with, including the murder of a man who was found in 1997 by the name of Danny Boy Edwards. The reasoning behind him being charged with the 1980 murders of Hack and Drew was that they managed to snag DNA evidence samples from Ed, which linked him to the crime. A quote from the Associated Press that stated that Norma Walker, who was Kelly Drew's mother, even at the age of 70 years old, had stated that instead of getting her closure, it had actually opened up old wounds. Quote, You hope this day would come, but now that it's here, it's really hard. Everything starts all over again, and the memories come back. He robbed me of my daughter, robbed me of Christmases, birthdays, weddings, everything that families do together. Images were posted of Ed Edwards that had him wearing oxygen, and it also included the fact that he was suffering from diabetes and wore a pacemaker. He is held as he is unable to post a $2 million bond, and he will not leave prison walls. In 2010, after facing the evidence that they had and some internal investigations by other inmates, they had proceeded to stack the murder charges against him for not only the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, but they also charged him with the murders of Billy Lavaco and Judith Straub in Norton, Ohio back in 1977, to which he pled guilty. Not only did they link him with DNA evidence, but Ed's own daughter, April Belasquio, had tipped off the police to his involvement with those murders. For these, he was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. But that wasn't enough for him. He didn't want to live out the rest of his life rotting behind prison bars. He wanted to be put to death. I'm going to take another small break, and I'll be right back with the conclusion of... Ed Edwards. Welcome back, and this is the conclusion of the Ed Edwards case. So he fessed up and said that he murdered Danny Boy Edwards. Here's Ed describing exactly what happened to him. 
also, I will note that this is very lengthy. It's roughly 15 minutes long. So sit back, buckle up, and listen to this asshole admit what he had done. Lived with some foster parents on the other side of town in Burton. And uh, he was 21 when he graduated from high school and he went to school with my kids. He got, the, the, the people there got divorced. And so he ended up going with, living with one of the kids that he used to be there. And, uh, and so anyways, that kid brought him to me one day. He said, I'm gonna put him out on the streets in Chardon if you don't want him. He said, because we don't want him. So we took him in and uh, let him live there. And uh, then it was after I started plotting to down the road to kill him for the insurance purposes and everything that we had his name changed to Danny Boy Edwards and that, but he was not a foster son. He was not an adopted son. He was a, someone that we had taken in. With Danny, I saw an opportunity to I mean, I was always a schemer. I was always thinking of that ways of making money. I've always been into crime. And uh, with Danny, I saw an opportunity here at the long range. It took about a year to set it up. And that's what I did. I set it up to collect the money and ended up getting $250,000 out of it. And uh, uh, it was arranged. It was premeditated. It was thought out. It was planned. <coughs> And that's what I did. He won AWA. I sent him the money. He got the money, he got a Greyhound. He won AWA and went to Columbus, the bus station in Columbus. That's where I went, and that's where I picked him up at, is the bus station in Columbus. He didn't come here. Then I brought him back to the house. And he stayed at our house unbeknown to my wife. He was out in the barn, he was in the car that was parked there. He was in the house. And uh, it was all set up. I'd already had a, uh, prior to him going into the military, he took out a, a $50,000 insurance policy named as beneficiary. And then while in the military. Did you ask him to do that? Or he did it voluntarily? No, I asked him to, but. Uh, but that was part of your plan then? That was part of my plan. Yes, that started back prior to him going into the military. Uh, then the name change was not effective, was not all the way through yet once he went into the military. When he went into the military, he was Danny Glockner. It was while he was in basic training that uh, uh, the name change went through to Danny Boy Edwards. So at that time, he had to go down and change his name on the records to uh, the insurance policy because the insurance policy had been made out to the people that he used to live with that already separated and everything. And matter of fact, one of them was dead. And so he went down and changed his policy over to, and named my wife and I the beneficiaries. And he, uh, he was going to get a medical discharge uh, from the army because he, he, he couldn't handle it. But it was about three days prior to that, that's when I talked him into going to AWOL, because he, he, they said he was going to Korea, and he didn't want to go to Korea. So I talked him into going to AWOL, or told him to. He did what I told him. And we went to Columbus, I picked him up in Columbus, brought him back here, and then that was part of the scheme that I put together, and it was, okay, we're gonna, he, I'm, re, talking to him as to we we're going to make a phone call that he burglarized the house and stole money and and different things like that and so then when he had it memorized and everything I took him down to Ledoux and dropped him off telephone I went back home and he called me it was being recorded hi pops how are you and we talked and I'm sorry I burglarized the house and things like that. I said, well, I didn't know you were even in here, Danny. And yeah. And so we went all through that and, uh, that he, uh, 
give the money to another person. And uh, so then uh, it ended, so I went back and picked him up and uh, brought him back to the house. And it was uh, the next night, I think it was the next night, that uh, he ended up losing his life up behind the cemetery because I told him that there was a fellow in Youngstown that was going to come by, pick him up, and hide him out for a couple months, and then he would be clear. He wouldn't have to worry about anything. He believed all this, and it was up there that he, where he died, and I uh, had the body partially covered and kept it that way. I went back up there about every three or four months to check because I wanted the body found, but not immediately, but I didn't want to bury it either. So I left it partially covered. And uh, the one time it was about a year later when I went up to check on it, the head had been separated from the body through the animals and everything. And uh, I took it with me and took it across the street and threw it up into the field. And the police and everything, they've been looking for it, but they can't find it. It was nothing but the skull. They've been able to, unable to find it. But, uh, uh, there was a hundred that, uh, found Danny and, uh, and the rest of the story, everybody knows it, uh, where he was found and, and why, but that was set up. And after he was found, it was, oh, I'm not sure, maybe a year later, maybe, maybe not as much as a year that I collected, uh, $250,000 on the, from the, uh, the investigation, but, uh, the attorney, I had an attorney representing me and he got a third of this. So the rest of it we got, and my wife, she was not aware of any of this. I endorsed all the paperwork and forged her name and, and, uh, she knew absolutely nothing. She's a very Christian like woman. Where did the additional, you said it was original, it was a $50,000 policy. Where did the other 200000 did he take out an additional policy? No, when you go in the military, mm -hmm. you can have different amounts. Of, they, they give you, and you, it comes out of your pay pay, and he was covered with $200,000 military. Set it up, this took the heat off of me. This showed that he did it. I mean, that he had burglarized the house and things. This showed that he was back in the area uh, and doing these things. Uh, and as I said, I had him giving money to another person. And it all, it took the heat, it put everything on him as doing all this and other people, not me. I didn't know anything about it. What happened to that phone call? That recorded phone well, call? Well, recorded was given to the police. Once he uh, was dead, I gave a, a call up. Uh, I told him he just called, and he gave them the tape and they, of everything. And they, so they had the tape. But when they come out and check and pick uh, the pieces of the glass up, had his blood on it, and everything. You used a shot off shotgun. I people can't imagine. How does it feel? The point. A shotgun at somebody and pulled the trigger. What were your thoughts at that time? Uh, don't know that I had any other than to. Uh, uh, I had a solid off two pistols, only this big, that I could hide it easy. Mm -hmm. And I never threatened him with it. I never pointed at him, said I'm going to kill you or anything. I never threatened to him, never told I was going to kill him or threaten in any way. We were up there in the back of the cemetery because I had dropped him off and went down and put parked my car at Riverside and walked back up through the woods on that side and come back and uh, I told him the guy would be here and he had a duffel bag full of clothes belonging to my children and uh, told him the guy would be here, I was there. I said there was some money in that down in the bottom of the duffel bag and, uh, and he was bent over kneeling down and get, feeling it around is when I shot him. He didn't even know I had a shotgun. It's when I shot him in the chest. So you're admitting to being a cold-blooded killer then? In fact, yeah, that's right. In court, uh, 
his half sister, a Danny boy's half sister, um, Jeanine Copley basically opposed the death sentence because she said, in your case, it, you know, getting the death sentence is an easy escape from having to spend your rest of your life in, in a harsh prison atmosphere. And that you know, you've always had your way with people, manipulated people. That is why she opposed this. Okay. What is your reaction to what she said? I, I said nothing in court. I just let her go. Danny and I both tried to find her. She was in prison. She's a drug addict. She's living on Skid Row uh, and under the bridge and in boxes and things like this. He tried finding her way back. I was with him when it happened and she was in prison. Okay, and now she's this, this she's hoping to get a dollar somewhere down on the line. And uh, this is her only interest. She didn't have an interest way back then of contacting anybody. And uh, okay, in regards to her saying I should be in prison, she's been there, she knows what it's like. This is, this is the front for her. I have four life sentences right now. Four life sentences running wild. Uh, two of them from Ohio. Two of them I'm doing in Ohio from Wisconsin. That's four. Now I've got that penalty. Uh, she had been bugging them up here. She wanted her dog in there with her. They made her get out, get the dog out. She was, it's been a nuisance. Uh, and that's why I didn't, we knew basically what she was going to say. And that's why we, uh, uh, I, I didn't oppose, I didn't say anything back. She said like, I don't work or I haven't had a job. I had my own construction business for many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I was paroled from federal penitentiary uh, in 1967, Jimmy Hoffa got me a job. Mm -hmm. I sell with Jimmy, he got me a job driving a truck and working dock over in Akron, local 24. And uh, that's what I was doing. Then I had one in construction, building homes and remodeling and everything. So I've worked and worked hard. But as I said, I didn't say anything. I didn't in any way oppose it. But her point was the death penalty is an easy way out. You don't have to serve those life sentences. Well, I'm, I'm 77 years old, going to be 78 in June. I'm not, I doubt, seriously, that I'm going to live long enough to even get it in 175 days from now. I'm a sick person. But uh, I, I went into this, my plan was, you want to try me for this, I want the death penalty. Jarga County knew nothing about this. They knew, after, I wasn't even in the radar. They knew I, everything they no, had. No, you, you were a, a person of interest way back. When, when in, in the, during the, after the first murder, you were, you were a person of interest. After the first murder? After, after uh, Danny Boy's murder, you became a person of interest. Um, not long, because they even, uh, I was cleared of the crime. That's why I was able to get the money. I was cleared of it. I was, I was set free on it. I was, I mean, naturally as a suspect, everybody around was a suspect at that point, but I was not, I'm the one that gave him the tape, to talk to Danny and everything. No, I was not, I was not a suspect. I mean, I was, but I wasn't, but I was cleared of it to where I was able to go ahead and collect the money uh, from the insurance policy. But isn't the reason you wanted to come to Ohio is that you knew Wisconsin did not have the death penalty, and Ohio did, and again, you wanted the easy way out? No, I wanted to come to Ohio because this is where I'm from. Insurance money. That's what he wanted. That's what he got. As I stated before, there's no honor amongst thieves. But Dan Glockner didn't deserve to die for insurance money. He didn't deserve to be taken to a cemetery, then trailed off and blown away with a shotgun. This guy was young, only the age 
of 25 with his whole life ahead of him. After his admission, he was sentenced to death in the state of Ohio for Danny's murder in March of 2011. Then a report came out barely a month later from the Associated Press that read, quote, An elderly Kentucky con man who pleaded guilty to five slings in Wisconsin and Ohio was on death row for his most recent crime, has died in prison of natural causes, an Ohio prison spokesman said Friday. Edward Edwards, 77, died Thursday night at the Corrections Medical Center in Columbus, where he was being held, spokesman Carlo Laparo told the Associated Press. An autopsy was to be performed, but it was not immediately clear whether it had been completed. Edwards' death was first reported by Daily Jefferson County Union newspaper in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. The newspaper said Edwards suffered from leukemia, heart ailments, and diabetes, needed a wheelchair, and often showed up at court hearings hooked to an oxygen tank. The cause of death wasn't released, end quote. Edward Wayne Edwards was dead. Unfortunately, not by lethal injection. Unfortunately, not shot in the fucking face. And unfortunately, not stabbed 31 times in the chest and head but died from natural causes because he was an old, degrading fuck. He would kill, leave the state, move around, kill again, leave the state, and move around. He did this countless, countless times, and unfortunately, nobody had ever gotten their justice for the lives that he took. It's really a goddamn shame, if you ask me. But that begs the question... Was he responsible for the others? Possibly. It's very possible. John A. Cameron's book, It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, the serial killer you have never heard of, has been lambasted by various readers and detectives and true crime enthusiasts over time. Hell, as I mentioned earlier, this case was brought to my attention by my friend Danny Shea back in Iowa. But there's a lot of people who are poking theories in John's claims that Ed Edwards was the Zodiac Killer, the Atlanta Child Murderer, Teresa Hallbach's Murderer, John Bonet's Murderer, and various other claims that seem incredibly far-fetched. There was even a docuseries that I watched that tries to piece John's theories to actual murders, and let's just say that there's a lot of reason why Ed's daughter April will no longer speak to John A. Cameron. As one reviewer had said, quote, Did not finish. Barely started. I thought it was probably impossible for one murderer to kill that many people and be involved in so many prominent cases, but I thought it would be interesting. Just a glimpse into the killer's own writings makes it clear that he is another con man who thinks he's brighter than he is. The author's writing is not very good either. And there are so many exclamation points, end quote. To which, yeah, they definitely have a point. As a detective, I think that John Cameron wanted to do his due diligence on trying to find closure for these families, but a lot of things are presumptions without logic or reason behind them. To be honest, I don't recommend this book. Unless, of course, reading a book that's similar to a script of an Alex Jones conspiracy theory is well within your wheelhouse. But that's the case of Edward Wayne Edwards, a narcissist, sociopathic serial killer that you may have never heard of. But luckily for the rest of us, we will never have to breathe the same air as this fucking dead shitbag ever again. And that is part two. I want to thank you so much for joining me on the Ed Edwards series. It was very extensive and I wrote a lot, meanwhile trying to piece together evidence for this case. I do want to thank you for listening, and if you dropped me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, which you should, I thank you for that as well. 
If you would like to help the back end of the show, please consider donating to the Patreon at patreon.com backslash murder and such, and you can get the show early and ad-free, as well as exclusive stickers, discounts on merchandise when, hopefully by the time this is published, it's uh, the merchandise store is actually up. But you can also, you know, put some food in my cat's belly and make sure he gets tons of treats. He really likes that. He's actually in my lap right now. But if you'd like to follow the show, you can find it on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Murder and Such. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, the PlayStation Network, Snapchat, and Steam at Huntor27. And if you'd like to become an executive producer, you can join the Patreon at the $5 level, just like all of these lovely executive producers by the names of Jason, Michelle Davis, Angel Renee, that Bama Brew Review podcast, Aaron Albertson, Michelle Pierce, Jack Stoyron, Alex Agwire, Justin Reebsom, McKenna Johnson, Ariel Safir, Stacey Jenks, Dan Sheridan, Benjamin Welch, Ashley Collier, Charkley Daniels, Erica Summers, Danielle Longamore, I'm going to try not to fuck this up, Heather Wright with Nature vs. Narcissism, Status Pending, and Ohio 88 Podcasts. I fucking nailed it that time. Big Daddy Thick Dick, Sarah Thompson, and of course, Ashley Black and Tech Support. But a massive thank you to my executive producers, a massive thank you to my cat who is currently biting my fucking wrist, and I thank you for joining me for this episode. Be sure to leave a review in Apple Podcasts, please. It really does help me more than you could ever understand. But my name is Hunter, reminding you to wash your filthy goddamn hands, wear your fucking mask. By the time this came out, we'll see what the uh, results of the election are. And... As always, I will talk to you soon. Take care. Tell him take care, Vincent. Oh, he doesn't want to fucking tell you. Okay, all right, all right, bye.